Hello everybody and happy Science Week. My name is Rebecca Spindler and I'm the Executive Manager for Science and Conservation at Bush Heritage. Today I stand on what is, was, always will be Gadigal land and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. As I stand on Australian soil, I recognise that I stand on Aboriginal land and I pay my respects to Elders across the country. Thank you so much for coming along today and joining us for a conversation about science and what it means to each of us. There's no doubt we're facing many challenges today. At Bush Heritage, we feel very strongly that it's better to light a candle than rage against the dark. And that is genuinely how we try to work, always developing and testing new ways of working, finding solutions to real world problems. At the foundation of all of that knowledge and an experimental approach is science. I have great pleasure of working with many amazing people in Bush Heritage working to generate and use knowledge across country. And in particular today, I have the great privilege of introducing three legendary women that will be talking with us all today, Claire Doherty, Chantal Bellotti, and Dr. Kate Fitzherbert. And first, I have uh, the pleasure of a conversation with Claire. Hello, Claire. Hey, Beck, how are you doing? Happy You're National Science well. Week. <laughs> Thank you, darling, you too. Claire, you have such a fascinating backstory. Can you tell us how you came to Bush Heritage and what you're doing now? Yeah, first I'll just acknowledge the um, traditional owners of the land that I live and work on. I'm in Preston in Melbourne and I'm on Wurundjeri country. So um, how did I get to Bush Heritage and, and where am I today? I had to think about um, what my role title was when I first started in 2007. Can you believe it? Oh my God. Um, I did a three month, it was meant to be a three month contract. So um, I'm still here. <laughs> but um, I, um, I came to Bush Heritage. I didn't actually know that Bush Heritage existed, which is incredible because I did a science, I did a social science and environment degree at RMIT many years ago. And a friend of mine was working here and he was telling me about this incredible organisation that he'd started a job at and I was just intrigued. And then he said um, that they needed someone to just come in and help with some of the, the planning. So um, that's how I arrived and um, I thought it was fabulous. We, um, they needed me for a bit longer. I was then it kind of extended to six months and then, um, yeah, here I am. <laughs> still here but um yeah. there was a key point um where i am today as the conservation planning manager that um we were doing an assessment of a large property up in the north that um kate fitzherbert will know about this one because i talk about it all the time unfortunately we didn't acquire it but in the assessment um we were getting a bit bamboozled by trying to figure out what it was that we wanted the property for and um what threats were and how we we're going to prioritize and someone um suggested we use this planning process and it only it was just kind of in its infancy so um, we applied that to the threat ratings and I just said well, oh my god why aren't we why aren't we doing this for everything so um, that's where the the planning kind of evolved from there and we've been building on that ever since so that's where I've kind of arrived where I am today. That's fantastic Claire and so you mentioned planning Bush Heritage also has a, a right way approach so can you tell us how we use right way science and the right way approach in planning? Yeah, so, so the right way means kind of practising science and planning that's, that's based on, on respect and sharing knowledge, listening to each other and, and learning from each other. And the planning has those key principles as well. So um, communicating with, with uh, stakeholders and engaging the, the, our key partners um, and doing that in every step of the process. So way, you know, way before we even get into some of that core planning is sitting down with pre-planning and, and making sure that everyone's, um, you know, their aspirations and their, their, um, their ideals are all incorporated into that, into that process. So the right way is, is about that. It seems like it, it should just be a no brainer, but um, I think it's something that we would like to stress that we're just making sure that we're, we're, um, uh, you know, we're considering and, and, and really serious about acknowledging the, particularly the traditional owners of the lands that we work on. And when we're doing research projects that we bring them in straight away, we wanna share um, the Western science view and the traditional knowledge view, because we believe that those two um, working together builds better, better understanding, better knowledge and better sharing in relationship. Yeah, that's perfect. So 
I mentioned at the beginning of all of this that we've got some serious challenges facing us, not just bush heritage, but the whole of Australia. Can you tell us what you think science does to, can, or can do can, to contribute to solving them? What you think the greatest challenge is? Yeah, there's a few of them, isn't there? There's a um, whole long list, but um, <laughs> I think science is, um, it, one of the beautiful things about science in the pursuit of, of, of knowledge and understanding of not just the natural world, but the social world as well. Um, and our brains are, have a, unfortunately a limited capacity. I mean, we're pretty amazing. <laughs> we all think we're pretty smart. We are, but we don't know everything. And I think science allows us to see a world that we can't see with the human eye. Um, and it just, it opens up an incredible world for us. It, it builds hope and uh, a kind of vision for the future when we can see things that we normally wouldn't be able to see. And I think um, one of the, the biggest issues is the, um, is uh, apart from that old climate change conundrum, the, um, the, the, the there's a real disconnection with, with um, nature and we, we kind of need to fall back in love with nature, um, be able to just, appreciate it for its beauty and its awe, you know, going out into the um, the world and hugging a tree just because it's there, you know. And I, I think that science, because it allows us to be able to see and explore that world, it does give us that capacity to be able to reimagine what a future and what the world could be. You know, let's let's get out of that shopping mall and, and go out there and, and walk through the theater and, and just, you know, re-engage, I think it really builds that, that capacity to be able to do that for us. Yeah, I think that's such a critical point, isn't it? The connection between people and country. And we, yeah. we so desperately need that. So the, the yes. topic for today's yeah. discussion is actually, is science going to save us? Um, and so I think that touches on your point there. How do you feel about that statement? Well, look, I think it um, it plays a, it's going to play, well, it does, it plays a major role, obviously, in what I said before about, you know, um, understanding the world better um, and providing um, that understanding, but then also providing solutions. Sometimes it can provide problems too, but um, I think not just science in itself, but um, there's there's other things within that, that that we need to think about. And, and often we, we see that, the communication of some of these complex ideas um, better. We're getting better at it, I think, um, in communicating the science to to the world um, in in ways that that is accessible to lots of different people. Um, I think you know there's a there's a real pushback against science often, particularly some of the findings that come through um, with research and knowledge is that can be quite frightening and scary, and we want to kind of pretend that we, you know, sometimes it's better to just pretend it's not happening. But I think, um, you know, combining that with the, with the science and with the communicating science and with um, the connection, if we can build that connection as well. Um, and, um, you know, and I, I often think too with building the connection, then you've got um, people have built more empathy. They have more um, thinking more about other people, how we fit within the world. And it can also, I think, take away the focus of, of this human-centric, is that even a word, but human-centric, um, you know, we're not the centre of the universe. The universe is there and then we just kind of, we're part of a, a bigger a bigger thing, a bigger world. I think that's perfect. So do you have a favourite bush heritage science story that does that? Oh, there's so many, you know. Um, I was thinking about this, um, I've kind of oscillated between quite a few and I, I could babble on for, and you'll have to, start you know doing this but I thought um one of the one some of the projects that I really love I mean I love them all I think there, there's so many but um is working with our Aboriginal partners and there's a project up in the Cape with the old club the golden shouldered parrot um and old Wall's the traditional um name of the parrot and it's a it's an important totem but um it lives in this little parrot lives in this um like these conical termite mounds and I don't know how the little dude even digs into these big mounds and then it, it, it nests in there and it kind of hides in there with its with its little chicks and the just figuring out what's I mean there's not many left um, but just trying to figure out all the 
the relationships and the nuances of all the different um, things that are impacting on this bird. And one of them was, um, or it is, uh, the predation of um, by butcher birds and the increased predation because of the Malaluca growth creating these additional places where they can perch and then they're kind of, you know, sitting out from the nest just waiting for these beautiful little creatures to pop their heads out and then they kind of swoop in. And But it's just, it just kind of highlights the, the relationships of all the things that are happening out there in, in nature and, and how sometimes it's really complex. And that's where science comes in to figure out where those relationships are and where we can come in and really focus in on that in that management and try and solve some of these little conundrums. So, you know, let's get, let's try and move those butcher birds away and, and, and save those little parrots. So that, that's one. I, I love that one. And I, I have to say, I was lucky enough to go and spend a bit of time with Micros and the rangers up in Ocala a couple of years ago. And not only did they understand country perfectly and know exactly how to, to bring back the balance. So, you know, with using fire, trying to get rid of some of that woody thickening that gave the birds cover to, to do the ambush predation. They were also just mm. super fun. You know, these are the cousins I should have had growing up. I <laughs> just yeah. really enjoyed being out there yeah. and being part, you know, being really feeling like I was contributing, but also just part of the ecosystem. I was impacted by it. I impacted it. It was, it was really fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Claire, so much. We're going to leave that conversation there, but we'll bring you back for, for questions at the end. Thank you. Great. Thanks. See you later. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce Chantal Bellotti, who's our program officer who works with all of our staff and traditional owners of the lands where we work across Western and South Australia. So welcome. Bye. Hello, everyone. Hi, everyone. I'd just like to acknowledge that I sit on the lands of the Nadagari Wulanyu Amgu Southern Yamaji region. I myself am a Wadandi Bridman Yacht from the southwest corner of Western Australia and acknowledge any other Aboriginal peoples uh, watching this today. Great. Thanks, Johnny. Claire and I were just talking about aha moments and the science moments that you just love. Have you had an aha moment in your life when you fall madly in love with science? Absolutely. I think I have them quite a lot, even to this day. Um, I think for me, I am so fortunate that um, my, I guess, my aha moment would be a very, very um, a beautiful memory of spending time with my grandmothers out on country um, and looking at flowers, uh, wildflowers, and sharing and the sharing that took place in just that small activity um, out in the bush of not only showing me the flowers, but that connection between what eats those flowers. And um, I think Claire touched on it quite well in saying that, you know, we, we've forgotten um, how important that connection to nature is. And while you're there, you're also looking at the traps and scats of different animals and um, so it's such a beautiful memory. And then I could also point on to later doing science in say high school and I absolutely loved the fact that I could look at hold a leaf up to the light and see the veins in the leaf that's a living organism and the veins remind me so much of our veins and our bodies and that connection. So yeah, that's I think that's the moment for me. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thanks, Johnny. And, and it leads on to so you you've said before there's there is no separation of humans from nature and no separation from between nature and culture. Where do you see science city in that framework? I think um, where science fits is is within the within the fact that Aboriginal people have been managing and conserving country for over sixty thousand years, if not more, and we are the walking scientists, the walking encyclopedias, and today I'll say the walking Googles. Um, our knowledge holders, which today we um, are currently in this process of, of naming it under the traditional ecological knowledges or, or cultural ecological knowledges, and our knowledge holders um, that we're able to share from, I guess, that um, the other sciences view and how these two in collaboration can work so well together in managing country. Um, we're very fortunate to inform um, some of the conservation activities that we do out across Australia. Yeah, I think I think that's absolutely spot on. So how do you see science being used in caring for country? Um, and I guess this is also the question you just asked, but 
is really important because it lends to the ecological knowledges um, in that everything is symbolic to us, whether it was a plant, animal or tree. And we have significant species that are also our totems. So we carry that knowledge with us where we are responsible and have an obligation to care for those animals, plants, um, significant sites across, across the world, across the world, across Australia. So caring for country is also our obligation as cultural custodians of, of Australia and our different regions. And these connections that we have, this is where we see no separation between nature and, um, and ourselves is because we, um, we have been and been carrying not only the knowledge, but the responsibility to carry that, that, um, yeah, that knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I recognise that every landscape is a cultural landscape that there's often a significant overlap between the ecological and the and the cultural values but then there are cultural values that you know make certain landscapes even more critically important to protect and that's something Absolutely. we try and bring in to our right way approach and the right way science approach that Claire and I were just talking a little bit about can you tell us about what right way science means to you and how you've seen it applied yeah sure um and I think you know, if we go back a little bit, um, the term people may refer to as two-way science is an integrated approach to working with other sciences and traditional ecological knowledges. Um, we often now speak about right-way science and with two-way science, we're talking about how the knowledge supports conservation um, activities and connecting cultures, cultural knowledge, sorry, with other sciences. Whereas right-way sciences is about not just collaborations, it's about co-design, it's about um, engaging from the outset and that looking at what targets and values are important to the Aboriginal group we're working with and how that may um, also align with some of the targets that we're looking at um, across our um, internal strategies. And coming together and having that co-design and, and co-development from the beginning is what I can clearly say is right way science. Um, an example that you, you did ask Beck, I think I'm quite proud to, to say that I, I do love the fact that Bush Heritage was approached by Maori people out um, in the, the Western area. Uh, I say the Western area is WA, that doesn't make sense, does it? So uh, it's the Birrali Buru Indigenous Protected Area um, out east of Wooloona and in Western Australia. And this group, this the Prescribed Body Corporate got together with Bush Heritage and said, this is what we want to achieve. We want to do this with our rangers. How can we do this? And sat down from the outset and co-designed um, their ways of, of managing country, but through conservation. And um, I think that's one of the best examples. I'm very excited to say that I hope that next year, um, pending, of course, our movements across the country, that we get to work with the Buddy My people who have just finished their healthy country plan. And what's been identified in there is their water values. And of course, Bush Heritage has said, okay, well, how can we work together in achieving your targets and your value and, and meeting your, and, and protecting your values whilst the benefit flows across all of the conservation reserves across Buddy country. So I'm very excited for that too. Yeah, that's wonderful. And thanks. And congratulations to the Buddy Maya people for completing the Healthy Country Plan. It's a huge amount of work to get done. And congratulations, because that, that really is such a fantastic guide for what's important on country, what are the threats to those things, how you're going to manage and whether you've actually got there, whether you've, whether you've got to healthy country, what does healthy country look like? So how do you think right way science is going to lead us to a more sustainable future, Shani? Sustainable future. I love those words because I've been, I think I've been looking at, you know, wanting a sustainable future since I was a young child, um, you know, and look, how I see it is that, that um, a lot of our conservation decisions are um, in the right way science areas and that they're Aboriginal led. Um, and the decision making is about this collaborative, um, the collaborative works that we're able to do to have a more sustainable uh, future in conservation is having Aboriginal people involved, not just the, um, the like on the, not just rangers on the ground, but everything right through from the policy, the development, the planning, everything. And I think that's really, really important um, that we have that because then there's employment and then there's that continuation from the cultural side of our cultural obligations to care from country, but we're also making a conservation impact um, across Australia in working with organisations like Bush Heritage. 
Yeah, I think that's great. And a lot of people get very uh, either confused or intimidated by the word sustainable, but really it's just a lifestyle that can be sustained forever. You know, that's, that's you know, if you can keep living the way you're living and working with your partners in a way that everybody wants to keep doing that, you know, that is that is sustainable. Yeah, and to go back out wherever you are, even if it's the local park around the corner from your house, to sit there and watch the butterflies fly past, um, to sit there and have the butterflies land on you and to remind you that this is what we're caring for, the awe and beauty that I think was mentioned earlier by Claire, that's what brought, I think, is the big thing for me. I still see so much awe in the natural beauty and we mustn't forget not only are we connected through nature and, and you can't separate the two, but the study of science is exactly that. It's the study of the natural world with the social world and how can we manage this together and meet and, and be sustainable. Yeah, I think that's I think that's absolutely spot on and, and you sort of hope we're all pulling in the same direction for that. Um, I'm not necessarily convinced. I think everybody at Bush Heritage is and I think everybody watching today. So let's hope that's that's enough power to, to pull us all in the right direction. Thanks, Johnny. We'll we'll come back to you in just a minute. Thank you sure, for that. Thanks, Kate. And our final chat today is with Dr. Kate Fitzherbert, who is our science manager here at Bush Heritage. And Kate, you equally have a, just a fascinating backstory of how you came to Bush Heritage. So, can you tell me that story and what your uh, tell me about your role right now? Yep. Um, hi, Beck. Hello, everybody. Lovely that you're joined, you've joined us today. And just before I start, and I hope you can't hear the dog barking, you probably can, um, <laughs> I would just like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri, Wurundjeri people um, of the Kulin Nation, and I'm sitting in St Andrews on Wurundjeri country at the moment um, and just pass my respects to elders past and present. Uh, yes, I have a, a, a long history with Bush Heritage. I actually came into Bush Heritage at a very momentous time for the organisation when they were just about to buy that very first big property of Carnarvon Station. Uh, and that was in 2001. And interestingly, I came in as a fundraiser, not as an ecologist, even though my background is in ecology. Um, and that was because they needed somebody to, I had been working for another organisation where I'd been fundraising for land purchase. Um, and so I was approached by Bush Heritage to come and help them with the land purchase of Carnarvon Station. So I ca came in writing fundraising copy and doing direct marketing. Um, and since that time, I've had a number of roles with, <coughs> pardon me, with Bush Heritage, uh, but landing as science manager is really the, the peak of it and it's a job I just love and I feel like I'm sort of back in my native habitat, which is gorgeous. That's fantastic, Kate. And just so uh, people around listening understand, Kate had one of the jobs that I think everybody at Bush Heritage secretly wants, which is to manage a reserve. So she and her husband managed Book Matter Reserve for a number of years and and really brought the place to life. But we also sort of, again, secretly talk about Kate as having every job in the organisation as she's gone around. What what, Bush, what Kate doesn't know about Bush Heritage doesn't bear knowing. <laughs> so we uh, appreciate that longevity and the, and the enormous diversity that you bring to the role, Kate. Um, you in this role, in science manager role, you are surrounded by science and Bush Heritage Science. What is the best part of your job? Well, it's actually being completely surrounded by science. That's the best part of the job because I've got uh, a finger in nearly all the research project pies somewhere. Either it's in the um, just the beginning of the planning or receiving reports or supporting the research staff or whatever it is, which is just a wonderful job. Um, and part of that, of course, is working with some of the most amazing people. These are our ecologists that we employ at Bush Heritage, or they might be university researchers and or researchers in other organisations and governments. So, and they are the best people. You know, they are dedicated, they're smart, they're committed. They're just truly good people. And it's an absolute privilege to work with them. Um, but the other thing about working in the science field, it's as both Claire and Chantal have said, it's 
it's being where you're discovering new stuff all the time. And that's just amazing where you see um, new projects emerging and you see young people coming in and do, doing doing the projects and then you see the results of those projects being fed through into the planning that Claire manages. So it's this wonderful cycle of knowledge gained and knowledge used and I just love that. That is fantastic. Um, I'm going to stick with you on Bush Heritage for a minute. What's your favourite Bush Heritage science story? Oh, look, how long have we got, Beck? <laughs> I, could, I, could, I could be here a very long time. I've, at the moment, I guess I've got two. So put your hand up and tell me that's enough when I've given you one, otherwise I'll get on the other one. But one of the ones I really love, and this is just it's a little project, but it's been one of those feel-good projects that is one that gives you hope. And that is in um, 2011, our ecologist in West, Southwest Western Australia was approached by the Western Australian Department of Environment to perhaps use one of our properties down there, Kojanup Reserve, as a translocation site for this little animal called a red-tailed fascigale. And the fas they're, they're, they're tiny. They weigh about the same as a chook egg. Their bodies are about 10 centimetres long, but they are just the cutest small things. And they used to be widespread across southern Australia. Um, but land clearing and land land use change basically meant they ended up being restricted to just a few small reserves, <coughs> pardon me, in southwest Western Australia. So the department was trying to um, expand the population by finding good places to put these these um species so got onto Ange, um our ecologist down there and they translocated 30 i think now these are really short-lived animals like the males are a classic thing where they they only live just one year because they after they have a mating frenzy and then they die but the females will live for two or three seasons and what what's happened is that the the these small animals have just They've adopted this wonderful Wandu woodland in our Kojanup Reserve. That population has thrived. It's now expanded beyond Kojanup to other areas of neighbouring um, woodland. And it's just a little, a little thing really in the big picture, but it's such a good news story that Bush Heritage has been able to help the re-establishment of this wonderful species. And can I suggest to all the listeners today that you just Google red tailed fasc, P H A S C, and you'll get red tailed fasc gale. Have a look at them. And if you get onto the Bush Heritage website, you'll find a whole lot of stories about them. And, and it's fascinating. So that's, that's one. The Perfect. other one. I'm, I'm going to interrupt yeah. you, Kate. We may we may come back to the other one because I've got so many other questions for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, and I think that's. A that's a really good tip um, and it, it was going to be my my ending thing and I'll, I'll reiterate it but saying it now I think the Bush Heritage website Facebook page we have a we have a website in there that's all about videos and blogs that are directly from our ecologists our reserve managers our people on the ground and those stories are an infinite source of light and hope so I thoroughly uh, second Kate's recommendation to go and have a look after after you listen to the rest of this webinar. Um, so my next question for you, Kate, I'm gonna lift you up a little bit outside of Bush Heritage and, and talk more about uh, what you think are the major challenges we're, we're facing in society at the moment and what science is doing to contribute to solving them. Uh, look, I, I think the biggest problem we're facing is climate change. I don't think we can get around that. Mm. Um, we're seeing the impacts of that both in subtle ways and in really, really dramatic ways. And it has the potential to make huge shifts in our natural environment. We've got to deal with it. Um, and I think that science, science is a really, really important part of that. Uh, and especially when it's, it's merged with technology, I think it's a really important part. But on its own, science is not enough. This, this is an issue which is as strongly social as it is scientific. And what we need is really good science 
well-funded, well-supported. But a critical thing is that we take notice of it, that we believe it, that we accept it, and that we implement it. And to do that, we need to bring the profile of science up so that people once again have confidence in the science. And we also need a um, really powerful leadership on this. We need governments to be leaders. We need them to support the population to change. We're going to have to move away from fossil fuels. That takes policy. We need good policy. We need powerful policy and we need bold policy. We need that. We need the community to do everything they possibly can um, in every possible way to reduce emissions. This is a whole of community thing we have to deal with. Science, it's technology, it's industry, it's corporations, it's government, it's community. And I think that the thing is, we know what we have to do. The things we can do are already there for us to do. We just need to get the policy settings in place and to do them. And we can make a major difference to the scenarios that we've been hearing about in the IPCC report that's just come out. Yeah, the IPCC report is a, is a real wake up call, isn't it? And it, it's not necessarily because it's telling us that things are much worse, which they are updating some of the targets and they're bringing some of the impacts that we are already seeing, to be honest, out on ground, bringing those forward. So it's not that we didn't know climate change was happening. I actually find it really heartening to see the IPCC report and those incredible scientists, some of whom are, are wonderful Bush Heritage supporters and partners, the amazing Leslie Hughes among them, come forward and be brave enough to assimilate all of that nation, that information and put it forward so we can do something about it. And I think it is just so critical that we, that we start doing that now. But it is wonderful to see the IPCC coming out with that information because it needs to be said 100%. It does. And I totally agree with you. And I think that uh, the fact that it's, I mean, we only have to turn on the television now to see that the horrors that are beset across the world, you know, fires and floods and other catastrophes um, that we, we, I sort of get the feeling and I'm, I'm, I agree with you, Beck. I think there is now a sense of hope that we've got to a point where the science is finally being believed. It's finally being accepted at many political levels, not all, um, but we are at a point where I feel like we're sort of on the crest of the wave. And from here, we know what we have to do. We will have the drivers to make that happen. So I think the science has paid, a, well, it's been absolutely fundamental to us getting to this point. I think, I think that's an excellent point, Kate. We'll probably pick that up a little bit more. But I've often heard you talk about the wonder of having the new generations of scientists coming through Bush Heritage. Can you tell me how we're doing that and what it means to you? Oh, look, this is a really exciting thing for, um, in Bush Heritage. And it's one of my sort of my babies that um, I really strongly believe that the next generation of young scientists, we have to cultivate them, we have to support them in every way because they're moving into a new and very challenging world. And whatever way we can help them to build skills, confidence in their decision-making, confidence in their abilities, um, we've got a really important role to play in that. So there's a number of things that we've done to try and foster this. And one of them is, well, the starting point really is to work out what it is we need to know so that we can do the research that we need to implement. And the way we've done that is to establish a knowledge strategy. And that basically was a conversation driven by Beck, thanks Beck, across the organization's researchers, um, the scientists and the reserve managers about the questions that they were asking about the land that they're managing. Um, and this also has been going out to our partners, our Aboriginal partners, about questions they would like our support to help answer. Um, in that 
as a result of that knowledge strategy being developed. So here's a, there are hundreds of research questions that have come out of our, our staff and our partners. There is a body of, of research that we can start with. There is a whole lot of opportunities for young scientists to pull some of these questions out and say, that really interests me. That sounds really exciting. I want to do that. And then to contact us and come to us and be a partner with us in delivering that science. Um, so that's one step. And that that uh, knowledge strategy, again, another plug for the website, is up on the Bush Heritage website. So if you're interested in doing anything in, in terms of research or science, hop on the website, Google the knowledge or put in the search knowledge strategy, and you will be able to download 350 research questions that you can go through and have a look at. Um, the other thing is, is then once you've got the research the research questions and you've got some interested students is providing opportunities for those students. So we have an internship program where we pay young graduates or those that are just about to finish graduating to work with us on some of our key research questions. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, at the moment this year, we've got eight um, interns. They're working on a whole range of things from, from fire mapping to data analysis to climate change um, to there's someone working in the field, all sorts of stuff. So which is also very exciting. And that internship program, we hope will just continue and build over the years. Uh, the other one is we're hoping to have scholarships for PhD students. This year we have six. We want to build that program as well so we can support postgraduate researchers. That's perfect. Thanks, Kate. And I will just acknowledge uh, Chris and Gina Grubb, who have themselves funded six PhD scholarships for us new this year, new students, new projects, and we already have an existing three PhDs that are that are folding into a really impressive program. So we thank uh, Chris and Gina Grubb for that. I think now we have a video from the Bush Heritage Science interns talking about their science and the solutions that they're deriving. Hello everyone, I'm Simone and I'm an intern working at Bush Heritage and I wanted to highlight how science is helping us deal with the challenge of mitigating the impacts of invasive plants. The spread of invasive plants around the world is drastically changing our world's ecosystems and impairing how these ecosystems are functioning. This ultimately reduces the beneficial ecosystem services that we're receiving from the environment, but science is helping us better understand how plant invasions are altering ecosystems, as well as helping us develop ways that we can actually manage these degrading species and protect and conserve our threatened ecosystems. Hello, happy Science Week. This is Anka, ecologist of Craven's Peak and Deathbooka Reserve. So just spend a few days on Ethabuka and uh, what I would like to show you in terms of solution that science has um, for the challenges that we face in the future. You all probably know that demand for meat is increasing, but the even more important thing is that we have areas free of livestock. So we have some refuge areas and I have the Ethabuka refuge sign in the back here. And you can see the, um, the um, beautiful ungrazed country that's now been grazing free for about one and a half decades. So that's Ethabuka behind me. I'll just uh, take you around a little bit. And when I'll turn around, I'm right here at the gate, you can actually see the trampled, uh, still grazed country uh, behind me. So a while ago, Ethabuka would have probably looked the same way. What's very important is that we um, keep monitoring these reserves and um, that we uh, yeah, protect species by creating these grazing fuel refuges. So the challenge I have decided to speak about is the impacts of climate change on landscape resilience. And I think uh, we have quite a good idea of some really meaningful and practical strategies to address some of the issues associated with this, such as you know, identifying and conserving pockets of habitat in the landscape that are going to be significant refuges from climate change impacts in the future, or, you know, conserving uh, significant habitat corridors that will facilitate species migration as the climate changes, 
and even using knowledge about the adaptive capacities of species based on their genetics and using that to inform how we restore landscapes in the future. Hi, Gary MacDonald. I'm a research volunteer working in the Central Victorian Reserve at Nardo Hills. Our challenge there is eucalyptus dieback of a couple of key species, eucalypt species in the reserve. We're using science to guide us to regions in, in Australia where these same species are, are, are growing reasonably effectively in the face of much hotter and drier climates and reintroducing seeds and, and the genotypes back into local populations to uh, help improve the resilience of them. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much to the diversity. I said interns, but actually it was a, a, a broad diversity. We had an ecologist in there, a couple of interns and one of our amazing science volunteers who actually has been running a fantastic project that we, we might get Kate to tell us about in just a second. But if I can wrap up the themes a little bit, I think I'm hearing from everyone that the next generation is key and doing our part to, to promote the next generation, to train the next generation and to make sure they have real world practical experience out on country. That's something the Bush Heritage is absolutely profoundly dedicated to. And I think fundamentally the question today was, will science save us? And I'm hearing over and over again, it's crucial, it's essential, it can't work alone. It needs people to be engaged. It needs people to use, implement and, and take up science knowledge from all sorts of areas to build really good policy to, to measure the impact that you're having and if you're not having the impact that you want to go back and re redo replan redo what you need to do so that you can have that ultimate impact and i know we've had a fantastic conversation without mentioning the c word but if we could just do what we've been doing with corona the science was incredible and i take my hat off to all of the scientists who've developed the vaccine that abandoned whatever it is that they were working on to deal with such a global threat of coronavirus. The vaccine was developed in lickety split record time. We have been rolling it out. I recognize there have been some hiccups, but for something that we've never faced before, I think as a society, we haven't done too badly. It is possible, we can do this. We need to do it around some of the other threats that are really impacting on our environment and on our biodiversity writ large. I think one of the key things that people brought up was technology, blending technology into so much of what we're doing so that what we're doing is repeatable and robust and can be applied across every single landscape. So we have a very strong understanding of what healthy country looks like and whether we're there, not, or there yet or not. Um, so I just, you know, I'm thrilled to have had the conversation. I'm very grateful to all of our speakers today. I think before I uh, be very, very happy to take uh, questions from anybody who's really interested to in the chat. Perhaps while we're waiting for that, Kate, I'll ask you to tell your second sign story. Oh. I'll try not to be too long. Um, it was actually following up, it was interesting, Gary was talking, that was about the, the Gary's project, which he mentioned briefly. Um, we had some very serious dieback on the Nardu Hills Reserve in central Victoria following four years of drought and then a week of, of 40 degree plus days. And the poor old trees, ancient trees, um, basically cooked, split their bark and cooked. They were actually cooked, so they've died. And what Gary's project has been doing is exploring the opportunity for bringing provenance of those same species that, that grow up in hotter, drier climates down and trialling them to re-establish ecosystem function in that landscape. And it's something that is a new innovative approach. There's a few other um, experiments like this going on around the country. But this one has been sort of ticked as one of the most meticulous in its design. Um, over 70,000 trees have been put in and every single tree, we know its mother tree, where it came from, all its provenance details. So we're able to track 
the success of those different genotypes, the, the genetic makeup of those trees, um, to see whether they are going to survive better in that landscape than the trees that are already there. And what's being indicated at the moment is, yes, we do have genetic variability in there. And some of those trees from North, um, central New South Wales are actually growing faster and more strongly than the, the, um, the local provenance um, individual plants. And I just think that's a really innovative, creative solution and one that has great potential across Australia. Yeah, thanks, Kate. I think I agree. I think that's absolutely such a fantastic story and it incorporates so many different mechanisms that Bush Heritage uses. We, we have incredible volunteers. We have amazing staff members. We have, you know, people that are skilled in so many different areas as well as collaborators and partners. And it's, it really comes back, I think, so much to what you've all been saying. Yes, science is important, but it comes down to the people generating that knowledge and applying it across the country. And yeah, we're, we're all very excited to see the results of the, the Climate Ready Reveg down on Nardu Hills. I think actually somebody popped a, a link into the, into the Facebook page so that we can, anyone who's keen to, can uh, pick up that project and, and have a bit of an understanding of how it's working. Uh, I have a question here from Eliza. Um, how do you each sustain the momentum to apply the science? It must be tough at times. Who wants Why to have a crack at that one? <laughs> Claire, Claire actually won uh, the award for a most enthusiastic staff member a little while ago. So you're probably the best one to handle that one, Claire. Oh, look, I, I think um, if you just have a, if you're, if you feel that connection and that love and that all that I mentioned before that we've all mentioned, then you always have hope. I think we work for Bush Heritage because we have hope. Um, sometimes the, the work that we do can be quite um, challenging, but um, I think we all, we're really always working towards finding that solution. Um, it might not be there in front of us, but we're always hoping that around the corner it will be. And you know, our, our science staff and, and all the people out there, our ecologists and our interns and our volunteers and all the people that we've we've mentioned and some of those people on the the call today, all out there, you know, searching for these amazing solutions and um, exploring the the world to 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 find those. I think that that um, that's that's really the the key there, it's that old hope conundrum, but I think it's, yeah. No, I think that's perfect, Claire. And I think, um, you know, you, you are, have again, a, your, you feel that connection and that love and that yeah. all that I mentioned before. Sorry, you, you are in an enviable position, Claire, where you get to talk to so many of our people in, in Bush Heritage around the country every day. And for, for me, I go on our Facebook page. I go on so many of our Instagram things because those stories are the things that lift me up and give me hope that every single day we're having at least a small win and those small wins join up to be big wins. And I think, you know, that's just to keep that hope that you can mitigate a threat, that you can make a difference. It's absolutely huge. So again, I recommend to you all that, that you go out and do that. There's a great question, I think, for Shani as one of our key partnership builders uh, from Claire around how can we talk to different audiences like farmers about climate change and the importance of conserving native ecosystem function? Is that for me, yeah. Beck? <laughs> Did you get some advice? I thought, I, thought, I, I thought, oh, that could be an answer that Kate could answer. That's why I was trying to thought. Oh, you're an expert um, talking I, I do believe I think that Bush Heritage has been in a position and certainly has been quite um, let's say uh, has, has been part of the conversations with our neighbours and we're fortunate enough to work with pastoralists and other landholders that border our reserves and to continue the conversation with farmers and the like about the importance of protecting our natural landscapes and how that can also assist with their agricultural uses on their properties as well. Um, we do need corridors. This is the, uh, let's just say, 
the uni science background in my head is, yep, we definitely need those corridors. We know those corridors for those native animals to be able to, to move between. Um, we need to protect our water systems because water is life. And from a cultural perspective, we need to protect those cultural flows that don't just stop where the fence line is, to put it plainly. It is across the nation that um, we need to protect everything. And that is why we need to work in collaboration with everyone across Australia. So our neighbours are very important to us, but so is um, communicating the importance of, of conservation and sciences um, to everyone. Yeah, I think that's, again, spot on, Shani. And I find it really interesting that people expect farmers and conservationists to be adults. Um, we're, we're all land managers and in many ways we have the same goal. And it goes back to what we were saying before about sustainability. You know, if, you, if we're all managing the land in a way that meets our goals for the next generation and the next generation and across the landscape, then everybody wins. And so I think there's a, there's a real opportunity and, and we're already doing with many farmers, particularly down in the Midwest, in, in, sorry, Midlands in Tasmania, um, where we're working actively with farmers to, to build a shared future where everybody has a role. That's awesome. Absolutely. Yes. And we have to acknowledge that we have to acknowledge that our soils are the most ancient soils on the planet. And we need to look at the ways of being able to, to balance what we do out and the impact that we make with conservation. And that's why it's so important to have these relationships um, with the different landholders. Yeah, I think that's I think that's crucially important. And um, it's it seems funny to say that you know, some countries' soils are older than another, but we've been exposed for 10,000 more years than anybody else because we weren't covered up in the last ice age. And it's it's so interesting. And an area that I know it's really close to your heart is the southwest of WA. And that's a biodiversity hotspot specifically because the soil is, I don't want to say poor, but <laughs> it's, it's had a lot of the nutrients washed out of it over those years. Perfect. Thanks. I've got one hopefully relatively quick but hairy one for Kate. Why doesn't Bush Heritage build anti-feral exclosures, Kate? Uh, look, that's a, it's a really good question and I will um, answer it quickly if I can. Look, there are multiple approaches to conservation and there are some organisations who do fences and they do them well. Um, our Bush Heritage has basically decided that we would we believe in the open landscapes, that to be truly sustainable, uh, you have to have animals back in an open landscape. And one of the problems about fenced enclosures, even those that are very big, is there are all sorts of other management issues which, which come along with that. And that is overpopulation, genetic um, sort of bottlenecks, uh, imbalance between predators and and prey, things like that. There's a lot more sort of hands-on active management that has to happen. And I think that, that having the two systems side by side that are supporting each other is actually a much better strategy than having one, one strategy only. So those organisations that do the fencing, they do a great job. They provide, <coughs> pardon me, um, the opportunity for organisations like us to take excess animals from them and to put them back into an open landscape. And there are challenges with that because of the foxes and cat predation. But I think over time we will find they become a bit more manageable. manageable pardon me. <coughs> um, they become more manageable. So I think having uh, multiple strategies is always a good thing and not putting too many eggs in one basket. Yeah, I think that's right. A mosaic of conservation approaches across the landscape are going to be critical because there'll be surprises. There'll be things that make one work better than another at a particular time. And as long as we're all working together collaboratively, which I feel a real sense of collaboration in the, in the conservation field now more strongly than ever. And it's really exciting to see everybody again working together for that for that shared vision and that shared future i think equally we we strive really hard to make sure that the benefits of what we're doing on our landscape flows out and that's harder to do when you have a, a fence that's stopping so many of the the digging mammals that we're trying to restore back into the landscape to build healthy soil 
and to, to mitigate some of the threats that we have across the country. If there's a fence stopping those benefits from flowing out, then um, it doesn't really help our neighbours in terms of the, the broader landscape. So I think I'm getting the wind up uh, signals. So I just wanted to, again, thank my speakers so much for the conversation today. As always, it's an absolute joy to talk to all of you. You have such intelligence and such amazing different perspectives, but we all come to the same place. Science is essential. It underpins so much of what we do, not just as Bush Heritage, but as a society, but it needs to be taken up. It needs to be implemented. And I am thrilled to have had the conversation today with these gorgeous people. Um, but please, if you ever want to know more about our science, we have, as I mentioned, the webinars, the blogs, the video page that talks about so many of our science projects. And you get to hear firsthand from our ecologists and our reserve managers about what they're doing on ground and how we're finding new solutions to old problems and even to new problems. So. Uh, please go ahead and look at our conservation science pages. We are investing in science more now than ever, as Kate mentioned, and there's many opportunities for you to be engaged as a collaborator or a student or an intern with Bush Heritage. So please go and visit our, our web pages and our Facebook and our Instagram and enjoy. Happy Science Week and thank you so much for joining. <laughs>